Welcome back to Monitors Unboxed. Today I'm going to address a few comments I saw on my recent G-Sync versus FreeSync versus Adaptive Sync video. Great feedback on that video in general. However, did see a few people asking questions, seeming a bit confused about various areas to the video, or posting misconceptions that I feel are based on older information about these technologies. So in an effort to provide even more information about Adaptive Sync, let's clear up some of the confusion and address some of the common things I saw. So to start with, I saw some comments comments about variable overdrive and its contribution to G-Sync. One comment said, I wish there was more attention given to the variable pixel overdrive of G-Sync modules. Another, it felt glossed over, but I can't understate the benefits of G-Sync's adaptive overdrive. I feel there's a bit of a misconception here about variable overdrive with monitors in 2024. It is true that the G-Sync module was the first to implement variable overdrive and that most monitors using the G-Sync module use variable overdrive, but it's not a feature exclusive to G-Sync module monitors. There are many scalers that use generic adaptive sync or are branded as FreeSync that also support variable overdrive. It's up to the monitor manufacturer to use this technology and some choose not to. However, this isn't related to the adaptive sync implementation. It's just that those manufacturers don't want to implement the technology, likely for cost and complexity reasons. I've also seen some monitors that use the G-Sync module that either don't use variable overdrive or use it but don't tune it well. This is why it's more important to look at reviews for monitors instead of looking at the branding on the box, which often tells you little about how the display performs in practice. And I'll show a couple of examples why. This monitor is the Samsung Odyssey G7, which was released in 2020 and does not use a G-Sync module, but does use variable overdrive. Its successor, the Odyssey Neo G8, also uses variable overdrive. You can see the way response times and overshoot are kept in check as the refresh rate changes. The ASUS ROG Strix XG27 AQMR is another example of a monitor without a G-Sync module that uses variable overdrive to deliver great response tuning on par with other good variable overdrive drive implementations. Some monitors without G-Sync modules perform well enough that they don't really require variable overdrive and so don't implement it. The LG 32GR93U is one such example I tested in 2023. This is only a 144Hz monitor. The refresh rate range really isn't large enough to justify the use of variable overdrive with this panel as performance can be very good without it. Then there are some monitors that use the G-Sync module but have a poor variable overdrive implementation. This is the MSI Optics MEG381 CQR Plus, which has a G-Sync module. Despite this, the panel is either slow or has lots of overshoot at higher refresh rates, depending on which overdrive setting you choose. It does appear to use variable overdrive to reduce overshoot at lower refresh rates, but in my review I described this usage of variable overdrive as poor. It certainly performs worse than the LG monitor we just looked at that doesn't use variable overdrive at all. If you're buying a display and restricting your search to monitors that only use the G-Sync module because you want variable overdrive, you could end up either missing out on other displays that have well-tuned motion performance or getting one of the less impressive G-Sync monitors with variable overdrive. The branding and use of certain hardware on paper is not always a guarantee of quality. With that said, if I was to generalize across all the monitors I've tested, monitors using the G-Sync module are more likely to feature very well-tuned response times and great use of variable overdrive. Not always, but it's more likely. And I should note this only applies to monitors using the G-Sync module. G-Sync compatible monitors do not always use variable overdrive and are really no different to FreeSync or generic adaptive sync branded products in the likelihood of using this technology. I saw a few comments from people talking about their experience buying a FreeSync monitor and ending up with a product that flickers. Often the sentiment would be that FreeSync sucks or adaptive sync is garbage or I should have bought a G-Sync monitor. Unfortunately, in these situations, you have likely bought a bad monitor and having issues with it, but the solution isn't always to just look for the G-Sync brand, assuming that's the fix. Like with variable overdrive, monitors that are certified as G-Sync are less likely to flicker because NVIDIA has a more strict set of requirements for certifying a monitor as G-Sync versus AMD certifying monitors as FreeSync. Part of this G-Sync certification process is supposedly testing that looks for flicker, whereas FreeSync certification doesn't appear to include this at all. However, there have been several examples of G-Sync or G-Sync compatible certified monitors that do still flicker, which is why the G-Sync brand cannot be used as a definitive way to purchase a monitor that doesn't flicker. 
One monitor that famously had flickering issues is the Samsung Odyssey G7, which is certified as G-Sync compatible. It doesn't take too long to find plenty of user experiences of flickering with this monitor, to the point where Samsung had to release a firmware update introducing a VRR control feature that partially resolves the problem. Nvidia certified this display as G-Sync compatible before this firmware update. There are also a range of OLED monitors that are G-Sync compatible, some of which use the G-Sync module. For example, the LG C1 series is G-Sync compatible, however it had VRR gamma flicker issues again to the point where LG introduced a firmware update with settings to try and mitigate the problem. The Alienware AW3423DW is a G-Sync ultimate monitor with a G-Sync module and it too has some flicker in games at low brightness levels, an issue that is found across many OLED monitors and one that I've personally experienced uh, albeit rarely, as I use the AW3423DW as my primary gaming display. Flicker can be extremely difficult to detect and test for because it may only be one specific edge case where you notice the issue. If it's one game that triggers flicker on the display under certain conditions, like at specific frame rates, and that one game is the game you love to play the most, that would be very annoying. But there are tens of thousands of games, thousands of scenes in those games, and then thousands more performance conditions. It's incredibly complex, virtually impossible really, to ensure a monitor works with Adaptive Sync flawlessly across all those situations, especially as some games do really dumb things like having highly erratic frame pacing which can trigger flickering issues on some of those worst case monitors. My advice for people wanting to purchase a monitor that has minimal or no flickering issues is not to look for the G-Sync brand, but to look at reviews that test for flickering. I'm always trying to improve how I look for this and have added more edge case tests over the years and also to look at user feedback. The worst offenders for Flickr will usually have the most complaints about Flickr on places like Reddit. If you're willing to wait a little to see what buyers say about the monitor you're interested in, rather than pre-ordering or buying right away, you'll probably be able to gather enough information about whether a given monitor is reliable or not. Also, make sure you're using a good quality display cable. Following on from the discussion about Flickr and FreeSync versus G-Sync is talk of issues with Flickr in general, specifically on OLED displays when Adaptive Sync is enabled. A few comments said, the problem with VRR is OLED Flickr and it's what is keeping me from switching to OLED. Yeah, this is a problem. Although it's not related to which Adaptive Sync technology the display uses, e.g. G-Sync or FreeSync, it's more an inherent challenge with how OLED panels transition and display colors. Usually OLED VRR flicker is seen in very dark scenes with shadow detail and dark grays, and when hitting specific refresh rates, usually well below the maximum, there can be flicker in these scenarios. But this is highly dependent on the OLED display in question, the game, the scene, the refresh rate, and the monitor's configuration. This isn't so much an issue with Adaptive Adaptive Sync technology itself, that part is fundamentally working properly, the GPU is telling the monitor when to update, and the monitor is initiating a refresh at that point. So Adaptive Sync is working, it's the same tech used for LCDs that don't flicker. What's actually the issue is the way the display panel deals with varying refresh rate data, how it transitions, how it displays colors, the voltages needed to drive each OLED pixel, and so on. If the monitor panel hardware is not well tuned to handle these types of input signals, it can struggle and start flickering. And this has been a work in progress for OLED over the years. Based on all the OLED monitors I've tested and the gaming I've personally done on an OLED over the last few years, I'd say that VRR flicker with an OLED monitor is rare, but not completely eliminated. It also does vary from model to model. Sometimes if I play a game that flickers on my AW3423DW, it doesn't flicker in the exact same scene on a different display. But that other display might flicker in a different game. It's quite unpredictable, but on the whole, I personally don't experience flicker very often at all. Of course, those people who have run into Flickr are not wrong, it's just that they will be using a different configuration that is, is especially susceptible to the problem. There's really nothing that Adaptive Sync technology itself can do to improve this issue. That's up to the OLED panel manufacturers to continue optimizing how this panel type works with a varying refresh rate and ensuring that all brightness levels, all shades, all colors are stable, even with a fluctuating refresh rate. A lot of people have been wondering why OLED gaming monitors have taken so long to hit the market in a significant way, and I think things like this, trying to get it working with adaptive sync and variable refresh rates, is one part of that equation. I saw a variety of comments talking about the success of Adaptive Sync and who was responsible for it. Was it AMD for bringing it to Vazor to implement as a standard, or Nvidia for releasing G-Sync for desktop monitors first? So let's clear up the timeline on Adaptive Sync. 
The first implementation of Adaptive Sync technology was VESA into the embedded DisplayPort standard for mobile devices. The idea was to vary the refresh rate down at times of low usage to improve the power consumption and efficiency of low power devices. While this was an optional feature of EDP, when first introduced it wasn't available for desktop monitors. NVIDIA came along next and introduced a proprietary technology that took the idea of Adaptive Sync as seen in EDP, but made it possible on a PC gaming monitor with a focus on solving issues with gaming displays rather than power consumption, such as the mismatch between render rate and refresh rate. As there were no desktop monitor scalers that supported Adaptive Sync and no GPU side support either, NVIDIA created a custom scaler that could do it, the G-Sync module, and implemented support in their GPUs for this scaler and the Adaptive Sync signals it used. Of course, the choice to go with a proprietary solution was also made for competitive reasons, not just because it wasn't possible at the time. After NVIDIA's announcement of G-Sync, VESA and AMD both made several announcements relating to Adaptive Sync. AMD first shows off a demo of FreeSync technology on a laptop, and while details of this first implementation are limited, it's likely this is AMD configuring their GPU to use the EDP Adaptive Sync standard to have the display's refresh rate match the GPU render rate. A few months later, VESA updated the external DisplayPort specification used in GPUs and monitors to add support for the Adaptive Sync technology they'd developed for EDP. This standard became DisplayPort 1.2a. It's unclear whether AMD created FreeSync and submitted that to VESA to be used as a standard, or VESA created Adaptive Sync, which was then branded as FreeSync. Each side talks up their contribution, but the work of both companies was required to get this implementation working. VESA needed to create Adaptive Sync that could be implemented into Display Scalers and DisplayPort, while AMD needed to create a solution for their GPUs that would allow them to control Adaptive Sync based on the GPU's render rate. So the basic timeline is as follows. VESA implements Adaptive Sync in Embedded DisplayPort in 2009. NVIDIA then announces G-Sync in October 2013, with the first monitors using the technology released late 2013, early 2014. At CES in January 2014, AMD demonstrates FreeSync running on a laptop. VESA then adds Adaptive Sync to the new DisplayPort 1.2a standard in May of 2014. Monitors using FreeSync are demoed at Computex in June of 2014, and the first FreeSync monitors arrive in the first quarter of 2015. In January 2019, NVIDIA begins supporting monitors using VESA Adaptive Sync, those typically branded as FreeSync, in their desktop GPUs and introduces their G-Sync compatible certification program. Personally, I don't think it's fair to attribute all of the successes that we see from Adaptive Sync today to one company. VESA, NVIDIA, AMD, they were all important players here. VESA developed Adaptive Sync for EDP, which was used as the foundation for several elements to the technology and implemented it as a standard. NVIDIA showed it was possible to use this for gaming monitors and using it to solve several issues with PC gaming, and they did implement it first. AMD was crucial in broadening support for Adaptive Sync and implementing it in a cheaper, more accessible way. Another thread I've seen relates to Adaptive Sync and input latency. Does Adaptive Sync impact input lag, and what's the best configuration for latency and variable refresh rates? While I haven't tested this extensively, especially recently, others have found that Adaptive Sync adds a small amount of latency compared to not using Adaptive Sync at the same refresh rate and in-game FPS. For the absolute lowest latency, you should game with VSync off at a high frame rate. That's the best configuration. The next best configuration is using Adaptive Sync. With VSync off and Adaptive Sync on, if the game's frame rate is below the max refresh rate of your monitor, you won't see screen tearing at a very small hit to latency. We're talking low single digit milliseconds. If the game then jumps above the max refresh, it's a standard VSync off experience with low latency and tearing. Adaptive Sync and VSync both on is also a good combination as below your monitor's max refresh rate, you'll see a similar low latency experience to Adaptive Sync on, VSync off, also with no tearing. However, and this is crucial, if the game's FPS reaches your monitor's max refresh rate, that will trigger standard VSync behavior, which will significantly increase input lag. What's generally accepted to be the best configuration for gamers that want a low latency experience but don't want to see tearing is to cap the game's frame rate to 2 to 4 FPS below the max refresh rate of your monitor. So on a 144Hz display, the best configuration would be Adaptive Sync on, VSync on to prevent micro tearing, and then capping the in game frame rate to 142 FPS. This delivers the lowest latency, no tearing, and prevents the game reaching a VSync state. 
I saw some confusion about adaptive sync over HDMI, specifically for NVIDIA GPUs that I wanted to clear up as well. There are two implementations of variable refresh rates over HDMI. The official HDMI form implementation was introduced in HDMI 2.1 and is an optional feature that display vendors can choose to enable. For monitors that use HDMI 2.0 or earlier, instead of 2.1, adaptive sync is also achievable, though this is through FreeSync over HDMI, an AMD vendor-specific extension to HDMI protocols. AMD GPUs support adaptive sync over HDMI on both HDMI 2.0 and 2.1 monitors, HDMI 2.1 through the native standard HDMI forum VRR, HDMI 2.0 and earlier versions of HDMI using FreeSync over HDMI. NVIDIA GPUs have supported HDMI Forum VRR on HDMI 2.1 displays since the Turing generation, the GTX 16 and 20 series. This is the case even though Turing GPUs only support HDMI 2.0. Essentially, they will operate with HDMI 2.1 displays using 2.0 class bandwidth and the resolutions and refresh rates this allows, but with support for the HDMI 2.1 VRR feature. Ampere GPUs and newer, which feature HDMI 2.1, support both 2.1 class bandwidth and HDMI forum VRR. What NVIDIA GPUs don't support are monitors that have adaptive sync enabled over earlier versions of HDMI like HDMI 2.0, which use the earlier FreeSync over HDMI implementation. I'm not sure how different the FreeSync over HDMI protocol actually is versus HDMI 2.1 VRR, but in any case, NVIDIA only officially supports the official HDMI form implementation in the 2.1 spec. So don't expect adaptive sync to work with your NVIDIA GPU on a display that is only HDMI 2.0. This shouldn't be too much of an issue for NVIDIA GPU owners as most adaptive sync capable monitors have DisplayPort which will provide adaptive sync capabilities to NVIDIA GPUs, the main VRR capable displays that only use HDMI such as more recent TVs all use HDMI 2.1 which also will be compatible with NVIDIA GPUs. So anyway, that's it for this one. Hopefully that has cleared up some of your questions, confusion around G-Sync versus FreeSync from the previous video. Hopefully a bit more information on things like variable overdrive, flickering, who created adaptive sync first, and things like HDMI, input lag, all that sort of thing. So yeah, if you did like this video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel for more content like this. I'm sure we'll be doing a few more reviews in the coming days, so stay tuned for those. And you can support us via Patreon or Floatplan if you want to support our independent testing. Links to those are in the description below. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.